Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Go Big or Go Home. I am old man Troy, joined by the youngster Kevin Cunningham, a.k.a. Kid Cunny. No fancy name. No other fancy names today. That's it. That's all you get. I didn't give you one on the Saturday show. I'm not giving you one on this show either today. You're going to have to deal with it. I'm just in the doghouse at this point, obviously. Because no, I, I did no, nothing my... wrong, <laughs> but that's okay. That's fine. It's like a married. It's like a married couple. You didn't do anything wrong, but you're still in the doghouse, right? <laughs> I just don't have any creative juices flowing. I, I mean, okay. I just you know I've been. Part of it is I think the penguins. The penguins are like they're drawing all of this emotional creativity out of my brain. Uh, I know people listening. To this is a Big Ten show, but I live in Pittsburgh. But I've always been a Penguins fan, Kevin. I don't know if I shared that with you, even growing up. Because I'm one of those guys. I don't jump on the bandwagon. So growing up in Green Bay, of course, you are you, – you have to be a Packer fan when you grow up in Green Bay. I mean, literally, if you're an implant, I can understand that. But as a hockey guy, there's no hockey. There's no professional hockey in Wisconsin. So you had two choices. At that time, it was the Minnesota North Stars, which are now the Dallas Stars, or it was the Chicago Blackhawks, or the Detroit Red Wings. You had your choice. So I'm like, well, screw that. I don't want to cheer for any of those teams. I'm going to cheer for that Pittsburgh Penguin team. So I've liked the Penguins for quite a while now. So it's all good. But they lost a tough one against Ottawa at home, so I'm kind of like just blah. Game two tonight, though, so I think they can recover. However, this is a Big Ten show. Before we get into our what I think is a, a really cool topic, I, I really do, because it's kind of what are you doing type topic. But before that, how has everything been down in the sunny state of Florida? And as I tell you that, I'm pushing 79 degrees today as I drive home. So it's nice up here too. But that is pretty nice. And usually I let it go on my little uh, spiel about the Florida weather. And it's supposed to be mid-80s and sunny throughout the week. So that, that's it. For me, I'm busy writing about Big Ten stuff, writing about, you know, Wisconsin high school sports, doing my little stocking job in the morning. So I'm, I'm busy and I'm dialed into Big Ten stuff. No, lac- no lacrosse talk today. You got nothing, you got okay. nothing on lacrosse today. Um, I know, well, I, I know the NCAA tournament for lacrosse is going on, and I saw Penn State lose to Towson in the first round <laughs> um, while I was on one of my shifts writing for the Big Ten. So I, I know Penn State's out, but I haven't followed it past then. So. Well, you got to follow that Maryland team. I thought you were the lacrosse guru here. Yes. Yes, I am. But that that's women's, and so I, I, I don't have an update for women's, unfortunately. Well... I'm telling you, next show, next week, we need a lacrosse mm-hmm. update, NCAA tournament, putting that on your plate. Okay. Lacrosse update. So, okay. well, however, we, we got a really cool topic today, Kevin. Back to all serious nature, because it really is kind of serious. Uh, you had said it, it caused a little bit of a, not really an uproar, but it gained some attention. And so I'm going to let you fill the listeners in on what we're going to talk about today. Then I'm going to give you some personal experience as a coach when these things happen, because it is something that happens in college sports all the time, but take it away, youngster. Well, during one of my shifts, it was Friday night, and so it was, let's see, May 12th. Uh, This past Friday night, I was doing one of my shifts for the Big Ten site, Atlanta 10, and the story came up with this Wisconsin quarterback, and he's, well, I'll just say this before I get into it, you we always share stuff on Facebook and we, you know, the tweet out our articles and we share the articles on Facebook on the land of 10 homepage. And usually, you know, you'll see the people reached number and for, you know, a, a slowish story, it'll get, you know, a few thousand uh, popular one will get like, you know, 10, 20,000, something like that. And then this one got as of right now, 68,000 that I wrote up, it reached 68,000 people just on Facebook. Um, that's not counting, you know, Twitter or just the site itself. So uh, this story definitely gained traction. And if you just Google the kid's name, it's Ben Bryant. Um, There's tons of stories, you know, filling Google's pages for I don't know how long about the story, different sites covering it. Um, But so he's a 2018 
class of 2018 three-star quarterback for Wisconsin. And Ben Bryant is his name. And Wisconsin had a, another three-star quarterback already signed to that class of 2018. So he was the second to sign, I believe, um, if I'm getting my dates straight. And it was December 7th this past year that he originally signed. So he's been signed for Wisconsin to play in 2018 um, for five months now. And Friday he tweeted out, I, th- I believe it was in the afternoon, May 12th, that, hey, I got an offer from the University of Georgia. You know, it, it's, it's really cool, <laughs> basically. Um, he, according to numerous sites that he reached out to after that, after that offer, it's like, hey, Wisconsin's always been my dream school. Um, you know, I'm humbled to get an offer from Georgia. It's Georgia. It's not, you know, Arkansas Pine Bluff. It's it's Georgia. So his literal tweet was humbled to receive an offer from the University of Georgia. It wasn't, you know, extremely excited to receive this offer. You know, can't wait to visit. You know, he's been 100% committed to Wisconsin since December 7th. It was his dream school. And then <clears throat> later that night, he, or actually it was the day after, so May 11th, he tweeted that, that, that out. May 12th, um, he had to reopen his recruitment because Wisconsin saw the tweet, allegedly, and took away his scholarship offer. So what's weird about it is, you know, again, it's not this, you know, huge recruit who's getting, you know, a ton of offers and, he pledged, you know, 100% allegiance to one school and his recruitment's closed and he made that finalized. And then he randomly said, oh my God, Georgia offered me. I can't wait to visit there. And, you know, my recruitment's open. Um, it wasn't like that at all. You know, he was a kid who was signed to Wisconsin and in today's day and age of re- recruiting, not just football, but recruiting, today's day and age, the kid, no matter the class, if it's, you know, this upcoming season, if it's three seasons from now, if they're supposed to play for whatever school they're committed to, they will get a ton of offers. I mean, it's unusual for a D1 kid, especially committed to a team like Wisconsin, for Wisconsin to be the only offer. So these kids typically get, I mean, even these three stars, especially quarterbacks, they get, you know, dozens of offers, um, multiple from within the Big Ten. Obviously, Georgia wanted them, and Georgia's got, you know, one of the top sophomore quarterbacks this upcoming year, Jacob Eason. So Georgia's already looking toward the future. And was looking at him. And so my point is a ton of these kids get a ton of offers, even if they're committed, if they're not committed, if they say they're hundred percent committed, they always get offers. And in today's day and age, social media, millennials tweeting stuff out left and right. You say, Hey, I got an offer from Georgia, humbled to receive it. That's it. That's all he said. And again, the day after Wisconsin took away a scholarship and said, sorry, you, you're no longer playing for us. So he had to reopen his, um, recruitment and then he tweeted out the day later may 13th basically saying hey you know wanted to address some lingering questions said that a georgia coach reached out offered him uh he said okay cool but i'm still 100 (laughs) percent committed to the badgers you know he he still had georgia's offer um but he's 100 percent committed to the badgers and then wisconsin called him and said okay you're done so nothing really crazy out of the ordinary happened. Wisconsin just kind of went a little nuts and took away a scholarship. But I'll say this, that this doesn't happen even at Wisconsin where a kid will say, hey, I got an offer from wherever, and then Wisconsin just takes away the scholarship. That's what makes the story weird. And will basically my feelings on it is that we don't have the full story here. A couple of years ago in 2016, Wisconsin got – a commitment from a kid and then a week later BYU offered him a scholarship he tweeted it out that kid is still in the class of 2018 committed to Wisconsin Wisconsin didn't take away a scholarship so this Ben Bryant kid class of 2018 three-star quarterback he knew that Wisconsin was going after other quarterbacks it's not as though you know there was any confusion here he was 100 percent committed he knew Wisconsin was going after quarterbacks he didn't care all he did was tweet out that Georgia offered him a scholarship and Wisconsin took it away. But again, my take on it is that obviously there's more to the story. It's not as though this kid just randomly said, oh, hey, I got an offer, and Wisconsin got crazy pissed. Because again, this happens every single day (laughs) with these kids. It's not as though a kid committed to Wisconsin doesn't get offers from dozens of other schools, and that's just Wisconsin. That's not, you know, a Michigan, Ohio State. 
Alabama, LSU, it, it's Wisconsin. So all these kids get a ton of offers. They tweet them out constantly all the time. That's just today's day and age of football recruiting. So that's the story with this Ben Bryant kid. And I know, Troy, your years of coaching, you have, a, I'm sure, dozens of recruiting stories you could spiel out to the public. Well, I could sit here probably for about two hours and tell you some extreme and some crazy things. But I want to I want to start this by saying one of the things that I always ask the kid, how many other offers do you have? Who's offered you? Who, who's interested in you? Because if you're a coach and you're that silly naive to think that I'm the only place that this kid's looking at, you're crazy. Maybe it was the business side of me that said I wanted to know my competition. Who am I up against? Because I really need to know who I'm up against. And then I, had, I, I don't know if I was just more brash. I would ask the kid. I would go recruit a kid at a soccer tournament, and the, the kid's dad or mom would say, whoa, hey, coach, what's going on? And I would be flat out, well, who else is talking to your kid? And they, they would say, you know, Joe Blow University and, you know, over here on the river, uh, they're, they're talking to us. And the kids that said they're committed to a school, my first question, why? What made you choose that school? I wanted to know. I got all the info I needed to know. Didn't mean I was dead in the water. Because, Kevin, what I would do is I would still offer the kid. If I like the kid and I want the kid, I'm going to offer the kid, even if he's already committed somewhere. It does happen. And, man, I, Kevin, I haven't coached since 05. So that's 12 years ago. 12 years ago this crap was going on. The only difference, there was no social media when I coached. But I had to ask, and I did that, and I wasn't naive to the fact that these kids were going to get multiple offers, especially the good kids. You know, the, you know, the kids that were maybe role players, okay, they're probably not going to get as many. But I didn't go after, why would I go after a kid that's not getting any other offers? You've got to kind of think, well, what's wrong with this kid? Nobody else is offering him. What am I doing? Maybe I'm a lunatic then for actually offering this kid a scholarship. Most of the kids, Kevin, when I coached, coached in Upper Iowa, when I made that transition from D3 to D2, every single one of those kids that signed with me and came aboard in that inaugural year, every single one of them, we're talking to other schools. There was a handful, I'm not going to name names, that had committed to other schools. I gave them an opportunity. I'm building a program. You can play. You're not going to sit on the bench. This is what we can offer. This is academically what we can offer, and this is how we're going to run the program. All you do is you put your ducks on the table and you say, here's what I got. And you know what? Sometimes it's good enough to have a kid come over and I guess I'll say to the dark side, I don't think it's lowballing. I don't think it's unethical. Every coach does it. And believe me, in the world of recruiting, it is cutthroat. There are no friends. There are no friends on the recruiting trail, Kevin. No way. We may joke. We may laugh on the sideline of a game. But when it comes down to getting a kid, there is no, there's nothing held back. I don't know how many times. I had to answer questions about a new program. You're going to D2. You're going to get smothered. What's your schedule like? You're going to get crushed. Yes, we probably will in year one. That's why I'm recruiting you, because you're good enough to help us build a program. So if you see, Kevin, I'm getting very passionate about this because I think it's ludicrous what Wisconsin did. Because the good kids are going to get multiple offers. And if you're a good coach and you're a good recruiter, you're going to get your kid. And if you've done a good job, which it seems they did, this kid was committed to Wisconsin, then why are you worrying about it? I don't know. It, it drives me crazy, Kevin, when I hear these stories about, oh, the kid committed and now he's decommitted. Who cares? You didn't do your job then. You did not do your job <laughs> if the kid decommitted to you. I have no empathy, no sympathy. I almost want to just flip them the bird because it's like, screw you. You didn't do your job. When I lost to recruit, Kevin, I didn't go pout in the corner. I didn't stick my thumb in my mouth. I just lost. 
You know, I lost kids. You're from Wisconsin. I lost kids to Marquette. I lost kids to Parkside. I, I mean, okay, go, go play. Good luck to you. Move on to the next guy. You always have a group of recruits. And I'll tell you what, if you're putting all of your eggs into one recruit, time to get a new job. You have to go three, four, five, six deep per position to get a kid. That is how cutthroat it is. So those listening in that know nothing about college recruiting on the inside, you don't just target one kid and say, soccer-wise, Kevin, for example, forward, oh, I love this kid. I've seen him play. This is my kid. I want this kid. He's the guy. Yeah, okay. If he's the guy, he's the guy at 10 other schools. Here's guy two. I like this guy. I want this guy. Okay, he's my number two. Probably 10 schools want him too. I've got to make a list of five, six, seven guys for every position to do the math. On a soccer field, 11 spots times seven kids. I need to have 77 kids on my radar because I don't know where they're going. That's how recruiting works. So, Kevin, this kid, and for Wisconsin to pull their offer, ludicrous. You know me? I'm a huge Badger fan. Huge Badger fan. This is crazy. Not good recruiting. You had a kid. Never. You had a kid, and now you lost him because you wanted to pull the, pull the plug. Are you that overwhelmed with the number of people that you have? And you know what, Kevin, you said we don't have the whole story. Here's the thing. Maybe they did. This gave him an excuse to pull the scholarship and give it to another kid. Very well it could have happened because there were years, Kevin, where I offered a kid, and all of a sudden the kid was available or I found a kid in another tournament and I had nothing to offer. And I'm like, shh, give me. I wish I would have had a scholarship, <laughs> but I didn't. So that's my little rant. I want to get your thoughts. Oh, yeah, I thought you brought up some good points. I think, you know, it's interesting. You're getting fired up, and this is, you know, again, speaks to the audience out there that doesn't understand the craziness of recruiting. And Troy's talking about D2, D3 soccer recruiting. And this country and college football is absolutely enormous. Um, nothing to take away from soccer, nothing to take away from baseball, basketball, any other sport. It's not college football in this country. And that's D2, D3 recruiting. And so he says, you know, <laughs> you may laugh with other coaches on the sidelines, but when it comes down to getting a kid, you'll do whatever it takes. Again, that's D2, D3 soccer recruiting. This isn't Big Ten Wisconsin you know, high-end quarterback recruiting. So if teams and coaches will do anything at the D2, D3 level for sports that aren't enormous in popularity, imagine what it's like for John Calipari in Kentucky or a little less of a scale Wisconsin, you know, trying to recruit a three-star quarterback. Again, this isn't a, you know, one-star, uh, receive two other D1 offers, you know, punter. This is a legitimate three-star quarterback that Georgia is interested in. And again, Georgia's got probably the best sophomore quarterback, true sophomore quarterback in the country this upcoming year. And I'm sure he will be playing on Sundays eventually. So this is a real, you know, legitimate Georgia offer. And again, Ben Bryant saying, I don't care. I was committed to Wisconsin five months ago. And, you know, despite recruits and coaches coming after kids and kids, flipping the recruitment and coaches going after kids and flipping the recruitment. Um, there's something to be said for Bryant coming out and saying, Hey, I was a hundred percent committed to Wisconsin. I don't know what's, <laughs> what's going on here. So immediately when you read the story and you hear the story, it's like, what in the world is Wisconsin thinking? But like Troy kind of said, there are stories all the time where it's like, okay, well, Wisconsin in this case, Class of 2018, Wisconsin had already had one other three-star quarterback recruited. Maybe a four-star just decommitted from wherever, Cal, and because Cal got a bigger quarterback recruit. And the kid's saying, hey, you know, Wisconsin, I see you've got a couple three-star quarterbacks. I'm sure you're not recruiting a third, but <laughs> I'm kind of interested in coming there. Would you want me? And the coach, Paul Chris, says, well, yeah, we'd like you. <laughs> you know, but we didn't think you were that interested. You were committed elsewhere. 
who knows what the backstory is. A ton of different things could have happened. That's just one example. A ton of different things could have happened. Like Troy said, yeah, you've got two three-stars, but say a four-star or a five-star quarterback or a five-star athlete or a four-star D-tackle that you think would fill a need better than a second three-star quarterback comes to you and says, hey, I want to join. Well, Wisconsin's out of scholarships as far as offering scholarships. They're tied to other players. This is still a year out, but still a, a ton of scholarships can be, you know, divvied up between other players. And so Wisconsin's like, okay, you know what, this three-star quarterback that we don't really care about anymore, he tweeted out an offer. You know, he's excited about Georgia, it seems like, so screw it. You're done. So, yes, I mean, maybe it's a questionable move on Wisconsin's part, or maybe we don't have the full story and Ben Bryant is screwing off and doing the things that Wisconsin hated, and he was on um, the borderline of Wisconsin taking a scholarship in the first place. We don't know. So we don't know the whole story right now. This is the initial comings of it, you know, over the last few days. We don't know the full story. We don't know if Wisconsin just wanted to offer a better quarterback scholarship to a kid down the road, um, a different position down the road. Uh, we don't know if Ben Bryant's been a screwball. And so Wisconsin has been like, all right, do one more thing that we don't necessarily like, necessarily like, and you're done. And then he does that. So I, I don't know exactly what happened. Nobody knows exactly what happened. The full story of it. But I think it's to be said, and Troy pointed it out, that you know even in D2, D3 soccer recruiting, kids and schools and coaches will do anything to get a kid to go somewhere or a kid will you know, say anything to get to go to another school. Whatever the case is, it's cutthroat. And no matter the sport, no matter the level, division, you know, FCS, or whatever, things happen, it's cutthroat out there between every party involved, not just the coaches of the schools or the ADs or the president or the boosters or the kids themselves. So we don't know the full story. We probably never will know the full story. But if Wisconsin does <laughs> someday offer a four-star or a five-star kid, even at a different position, you can almost make the assumption it's like, okay, Wisconsin probably just wanted this kid. And so to, leave, to lose a second three-star quarterback for a class a year from now, who knows, Wisconsin probably had bigger fish to fry in the end. That's probably my assumption, but, again, we don't know the whole story. Hey, Kevin, I want to jump on Wisconsin's side, and I want to defend Wisconsin because kids, especially, and this has happened since scholarships were being handed out, deep commitments to schools. And part of this to blame is the media the NCAA for allowing scholarships to be offered at such a young age, blah, blah, blah. But kids change their mind all the time. They'll say, I'm going to Wisconsin. Now I'm going to Michigan. Now I'm going to Auburn. Now I'm going to go to Cal. Now I'm going to go to Florida. They change their mind like the wind. So I never understood why colleges get the rap when they will pull a scholarship like this. I'm going to stand up for Wisconsin because kids do it all the time. Nobody jumps on the kid saying, well, you committed there. You should go there. But if a school does it like Wisconsin, you, com you offer, you, you should honor that. Being a former coach, I never rescinded an offer. I never did. Did I have thoughts of wanting to? Yes. And you have to remember, I coached in a time where there was no Internet. But you go to a tournament after you've offered a kid, and I will tell you this. I told you I could tell you a ton of stories. I was hoping that a kid would turn my offer down after I found out some things being at a tournament, things that were happening that I didn't think would fit with my program, had nothing to do with skill set. But I wasn't going to rescind the offer, but I was hoping he'd turn it down. Eventually he did. So for me it was good. So – the schools never get really – the schools get the bad rap, Kevin, if they rescind an offer. They're like, well, you did it. You should not do that. But the kids never – I can't remember a kid getting chastised for decommitting and going to another school. But if a school does it, Kevin, they are on the pedestal. They're getting backlash. They're getting yelled at. They're getting – 
oh, you're so unethical, you're greedy, blah, blah, blah. I'm standing up for Wisconsin on this one, Kevin, because you know what? There probably is more to this story, but who cares? Kids do it all the time, and they're not going to get questioned as to why they do it. Well, they'll get the question. Uh, and they'll give you the blanket answer that, oh, well, I got a chance to play, blah, blah, blah. But there's other things that are involved here. But if a school does it, they're getting knocked. They're getting black eyes, and I don't agree with it. Because if a kid can do it all the time, but a school does it, you know what, I've been in that realm. I've been in the realm of recruiting. I've made some mistakes. I offered where I shouldn't have offered. Maybe I pulled the trigger because, like I said, you've got a list of five, six, seven guys at one position, and sometimes you do offer out of desperation. Like, man, I've lost one, two, three, and four. I need five. I need number five. I, I can't go down to seven. I need five. And so you'll offer, and then it's like, man, why in the heck did I do that? Why did I do that? This is not a good fit, blah, blah, blah. I personally don't re- never rescinded an offer, Kevin. But I want to get your quick thoughts on here. Do you think schools get a bad rap when they – do what Wisconsin did and rescind an offer. No, of course. I mean, and that's this whole story. It's like this kid is saying, hey, I've been 100% committed since day one, five months ago when I committed to you. And so who are you to take my scholarship away when I, just like every other kid in your class of 2017, 18, 19, 20, whatever, and the last 10 years, 15, 20 years, have gotten multiple offers from multiple schools because you're Wisconsin. You're not Arkansas Pine Bluff. You're not <laughs> this team that's the only D1 team offering scholarships to kids full ride. Um, you know, you're not doing the kid a service by offering the scholarship. The kid is saying, I'm 100% committed to you. So what? <laughs> just because I got offered from another school just like everybody else, Why would you take that scholarship away from me? So, of course, Wisconsin in this story looks absolutely atrocious. And I agree. I mean, they do look atrocious, but we don't know the full story. But so I thought (laughs) you brought it up that, okay, well, does a school ever look terrible um, when it could be a kid's fault? And when a kid actually does flip and say it's, you know, and this happens with four-star, five-stars more so, they get more coverage, publicity, and, you know, a kid is committed to Oklahoma or LSU or Alabama. And then, like, a couple days before <laughs> National Recruiting Signing Day comes and they flip it, this happened a few years ago, to Ole Miss. And that's when Ole Miss sucked. They were absolutely terrible. And then Ole Miss randomly had a top five class. They got, like, the number one safety, the number one offensive tackle. I think that was Larry Tunsil that year. Um, they got the number one wide receiver, Laquan Treadwell who's in the NFL now, they got a number of like top two position guys at their position. And that's when Ole Miss was terrible. And everyone's like, okay, so how much money did you offer the kid (laughs) to go to your school? Which of course is illegal. Um, But how much money did you throw at the kid to get him to say no to Tennessee and Florida state and Miami and LSU and Arkansas and Alabama in order to go to Ole Miss, why would he want to go there? Of course, you are the big, bad, terrible school trying to pry recruits away from good old Wisconsin and Oklahoma and Texas and Alabama. So how much money did you offer the kid? So that immediately, even if the kid is flipping his commitment and saying, hey, I committed to LSU, and then months later, randomly out of nowhere, oh, wait, sorry, I, 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 I changed my decision. I'm going to Ole hey, Miss. Hey, Kevin. I'm going to have you hold your thought and keep your thought process because I want to chime in with a quick story, and this is a, a true story. I had a very good recruit, and, back, uh, and of course, back when I coached, they had, they had a star system, but this was a, an all-state player in, in Minnesota and came for his official visit. Parents came, and the parents literally sat in my office, Kevin, and said, we're going wherever we get the most money. That is a true story. So – as a Division II school, I could not offer a full scholarship. And I said, well, then apparently you're not coming here. I still offered, like we talked about in the beginning of this, this, the show. But at the end of the day, those parents were manipulating where that kid went. I had a chance to talk to the kid one-on-one while he was hanging out with, with the players, doing his things on his official visit in my office without the parents there. He loved the program. He was from Duluth, Minnesota. I was in Iowa, which wasn't too far from home. Uh, maybe a four-hour drive, five-hour drive. 
he loved the program, loved the guys, had a great time on his visit, would have loved to have played there, thought he would fit in. He wanted to play immediately as a freshman. He would have been a starter for me, hands down. No, he did not end up coming to my school because mom and dad were only going to let him go where he got the most money. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I wanted to throw that out because it kind of goes to what you're saying about how much money did you give them. Sometimes it's the parents in the coach's ear going, you give me money, I'll, my kid will come. And I don't think that's right, Kevin. Don't think it's right, but I dealt with it as a coach. It's reality. Parents are in the coach's ear. How much money can you give me? Well, Wisconsin gave me eight grand. Can you give me ten? It happens and I don't like it. Parents need to keep, keep their snot out of the whole thing. Leave it be. Leave it be. Let the kid decide where he's going to be happy playing and keep your nose out of it. Okay, Kevin, you're getting me all worked up. Go back to your point. Had to throw that in there. <laughs> no, and any time that something like that pops up, please do cut me off and say, shut up, let me tell the story because it's good. Please do <laughs> interject when you have something like that because I thought that was awesome. That's Again, that's D2 soccer recruiting. And a, a kid's parents say, hey, we want money <laughs> for, for us to go to your school. So it's illegal in general, a five-star, number one, you know, Andrew Luck, you know, getting offered Stanford and this great scholarship and prestigious Stanford and you're smart as hell for going there. But I'm sure there were schools out there like – Tulsa and Oklahoma and Oklahoma State and North Dakota and whatever school, I'm just throwing out random schools that legitimately offered Andrew Luck money to go to their school or any other five-star, you know, Deshaun Watson was a huge five-star recruit who went to Clemson, you know, winning the high jump in the state of Georgia when he was in middle school, you know, stuff like that. Obviously, of course, schools offered Deshaun Watson way more than just hey, you can be our starting quarterback for a few years, and then you go to the NFL. Uh, we got a good coach, and we play in a decent conference, and you'll, so you'll be on TV. Uh, you'll be our star quarterback, and, you know, that's it. You'll, you'll get a full scholarship. Of course, there were teams that offered him money to go to whatever school. And that's not to say that Alabama doesn't do it. That's not to say Ohio State doesn't do it. That's not to say Wisconsin doesn't do it. That's not to say, again, the school I randomly keep using, Arkansas Pine Bluff doesn't try and get a four-star superstar quarterback to randomly join their school and offer them money. I don't know which schools do it, but again, even as Troy just pointed out, D2 soccer, and the parents are saying, no, sorry, you're not offering us money, which is illegal, so we won't go to your school. That's D2 soccer. So who knows what's going on <laughs> with D1 football, and there's always this thing – where me personally, I'm an Ohio State football guy. I'm a Duke basketball guy. I'm a Tennessee Titans football guy. I'm all over the place in terms of where my fandom goes. But do I think that Ohio State, and it's been proven under Jim, Press Jim Trussell multiple times, the kids get free tattoos <laughs> at Ohio State. They walk into a tattoo parlor and say, hey, we're poor, we're college students, we're the star of the football team. Can we get a little discount on our tattoos? And the tattoo guy says, well, you can get 100% off. We will give you a free tattoo. You know, tell your friends we're a great tattoo place. You know, we love Ohio State football. We'll give you free tattoos. Stuff like that. It doesn't even have to be, hey, we'll give you 100 grand to join our school. We'll give you 10 grand plus, you know, free food for your entire collegiate career to join the school. It doesn't even have to be that. It has to be, you know, potentially just free merchandise, free stuff, free tattoos half off groceries at the local, you know, whatever grocery store is at your school campus. You know, these coaches and athletic directors and schools and parents will ask for, or students will ask for anything from under the sun to try and get an advantage for their kid or to get a kid to join a school. And so my point with this is that, again, I'm an Ohio State fan and it's already been proven that Ohio State gives benefits to kids that go to school there. That's not to say that that's happening right now even though I do think personally it is, that's just me. My point is that it doesn't even have to be in Ohio State. It can be a Tulsa in the middle of nowhere offering kids and giving a little something, whether it's a little extra food money or just straight up money up front or money for your parents to pay their rent until you get to the NFL or whatever the case is. I think legitimately that every single D1 school and it's, I'm sure it's past D1 because Troy's even talking about D2 soccer. 
moms trying to get money for their kid to go to school. But I legitimately think that D1, every single program recruiting football kids, cheat in some way. Literally, I believe that, that every school cheats in one way or another, whether you're the almighty, you know, prestigious Stanford or Northwestern in the Big Ten's case. So, oh, my God, we're so smart. You know, why would we cheat? We're terrible at football. Ha ha. No, I think whether it's coaches using a little more practice time than they're literally allowed to or coaches sending more emails or texts to a kid than they're literally allowed to. The NCAA has all these rules up. I think whatever the case may be, it may be one text too many. It may be $100,000 on top of a scholarship. Whatever the case may be, as egregious as it may be or as ridiculous as it may be, like an extra 15 minutes of practice time each week for your kickers, that's still illegal. I literally think that every single school in D1 football cheats in some way or another when it comes to recruiting or kids, practice times, whatever. I think every school cheats. It doesn't have to be, again, $100,000 on top of a scholarship for a star player. It can be a little extra practice time, a, a free meal, you know, once a month, you know, given to you by the coach or whatever, free pizza, what, whatever the case is. And I don't even know if that's illegal, but <laughs> my point is I think every school cheats. Don't think that your school, because you're a fan or alumnus of that school, doesn't cheat because you went there and you never heard about anything. I literally think every D1 football school team cheats in some way or another. Kevin, if you go by the lay, of the, the lay of the land and the law of the book, and if anybody's read the NCAA rule book, kudos to you. I will pat you on the back. As a coach, I, I didn't, did not read the whole – I did not read the whole rule book myself, but the rule in a general sense, Kevin, as it relates to cheating, if you give your team something that a normal student athlete cannot receive, that is illegal. So, <laughs> I mean, that's the gray, that's the gray definition. That's the, the dummy down um, I guess, example. But basically, as a coach, you have to realize anything that you do for your program, if you do something or offer your team something, it has to be something that would be readily available to any student on campus. Unless they've changed the rule book. Now, again, it's been a while since I've coached, but I think the rule probably has not changed. It may have been tweaked a little bit, but you had mentioned free pizza. That would have been a violation, at least when I was coaching. Yeah, and so, again, I don't think the magnitude of, and it doesn't have to be necessarily cheating, but it can be just a little free pizza once a month given to you by your coach or whoever. That's still free money, free food, free stuff for you that you should not be getting from your institution. So it's technically illegal. So, again, I, I don't think that any – D1 football school doesn't cheat and plays 100% perfectly by the rules. And, it, again, it doesn't have to be necessarily called cheating, but just giving whatever benefit, even at Whitewater, and I was the sports editor of the school paper, and it was somewhat – it wasn't known, but there were definitely whispers, and it was brought to my attention, that even the football kids at Whitewater, a D3 school, were given maybe potentially – a little preferred housing and were given a little perks within the house. I couldn't ever, you know, prove it or went out of my way to try and prove it. There was no real way for me to actually get to it. But unless there was a kid probably, you know, mad at the football team or coach or kicked off a team or didn't get that benefit that they were promised, maybe I should have dug into it a little deeper and done actual, you know, investigative reporting on it. But even at Whitewater, a D3 football school, there were whispers that there were a little extra benefits for the football kids going there. That's just a D3 football team. So I imagine a four-star, five-star, number one, future NFL first-round pick, guy like Jabril Peppers. You know, imagine <laughs> the offers that he was given. Not just, hey, a free TV in your house, or hey, a free pizza once a month. I'm sure he was offered ten grand a year, or his parents being – you know, not having to worry about their mortgage until he goes to the NFL. I'm sure Jabril Peppers was offered that. Not to say that Michigan offered it and he gets got free stuff, but whether it was a hundred grand on top of your um, scholarship or 
again, just an extra 15 minutes of practice time and a free pizza once a month. I think every school cheats. That's my just random thought on D1 recruiting and how you know sketchy it can be. Um, kids getting six figures worth of money for attending a school maybe that they weren't going to until a school at the last second offered it. So I think that Kevin, stuff happens all the time. Yeah, Go you're ahead. opening up a can of worms. Yeah, I mean, literally, you could get me going off on this. Um, one thing you've brought up a couple of times that I want fans or listeners to know, you brought up practice time. And people are probably wondering, well, what are you talking about, 50 minutes of practice time? Again, if you've read the NCAA rule book, there are certain periods and certain times that each sport can practice. And there's a certain number of hours as a coach that I can have my student athletes involved in athletic related activities so if i had a film study for an hour and a half that counted toward my weekly practice time even though we never hit the field and all we did was watch film if we had a team meeting that is an athletic related activity i have to document all of that so you talk about 15 minutes extra of practice time kevin i think it'd be a little bit more i know i know coaches and, again, you always mention D2 soccer. Yes, D2 soccer. I'm, like, talking about a level here where these things, you think everything is pristine and, oh, you go play soccer and everybody pats each other on the back. Hell no. Hell no. There's people that were investigated in D2, even D3, for violating the number of hours you can practice per week in our conference. And it was a, no, a coach brought it up, and it wasn't even against a good team. It was against the team, and it's like you cannot practice outside of this time, and it had to do with playing an indoor soccer season, and the coach being on the sideline. How stupid are you? Uh, that, that's just ridiculous. You can't do that. That counts as practice time, and now you're out of season. So screw you, buddy. Boom, you're done. My point, again, you brought it up, and I don't know if the fans realize. Yes, extra practice time is a rules violation should you go over the allotted amount of time that you can spend as a team and as a coach with your team. Now, they can organize on their own and go play, nothing sponsored by the coach, the school. So using my example, had that team played, Kevin, in that, in that winter league with their coach not present, it would have been fine. But he showed up. And that's the thing. He showed up. And it can be counted and viewed as practice. So I wanted, again, I, I hate to interrupt you when you're going, but I had to throw another story in. Oh, yeah. And, again, anytime you have a relevant story that pops into your head and you don't want to forget about it because you're really old or – but just kidding. But anytime you have a relevant story that makes perfect sense, and, again, that <laughs> offering kids money um, – for, for school, I thought was an excellent thing. Um, point being, you know, anytime you have a story, relevant story, feel free to cut me off, literally. I, I <laughs> Zero sarcasm added to that whatsoever. Um, but so, yeah, the, the last thing I wanted to really touch on with recruiting, and we talked about this before, before I started talking about how every D1 school cheats in football, was that the kids also make this a little bit of a circus as well. And it's not, again, against the school in any way, but these kids are given a ton of cameras and the crowd from their, home, their hometown is going to the kids' gyms so that they can have three hats on a table and be broadcast on ESPNU every single year. And you've got, you know, a UCLA hat, a USC hat, and a Michigan hat. Or I guess in the Big Ten we can use the example USC, Michigan, Ohio State. And this kid will come with an Ohio State shirt on to the, the press conference and their little uh, signing conference. And they'll say, okay, you know, I'm here to make my decision and it's the best thing for me and my family. And, you know, I've got an Ohio State shirt on. So my decision to play college football for the next four years is, and then he'll rip off his shirt and there will be a Michigan shirt underneath and he'll put on the Michigan hat and everyone will go crazy and laugh. And, you know, so it's this whole circus that, even kids, you know, take full advantage of the TV time that they're given to pick and choose a school. And then even then, when that happens, a couple of days can pass by and then they can flip their recruitment and commitment to another school. 
<laughs> after all the theatrics are over. So I don't blame 100% of it on the schools. I don't blame 100% of it on the kids. I don't blame 100% of it on the media. I think there's fair blame to go around with all this recruiting shenanigans, whether the schools are partly in the wrong, kids are partly in the wrong, kids' parents are pro- partly in the wrong, the media for covering all this as if it's, you know, we're all going to die if we don't decide and find out where this five-star offensive tackle is going to go to school, whether it's, you know, UCLA or USC. Um, I think the whole social media and just uplifting of the attention that these recruits get on a year to year basis, especially now with social media and Skype and Instagram and just any possible thing you can think of Facebook live, you know, there's so many ways to broadcast yourself and get your thoughts out to the world for them to know in a matter of two seconds, I can go on my phone and tweet something uh, ridiculous. And two seconds later, I'll get retweets and, Oh my God, what are you thinking? You're an idiot. You know? So anyone across the world, two seconds from now can read my tweet and call me an idiot. That's how easy it is for kids to be able to access and make an impression on someone, you know, across the country, across the world, whatever. I just think it's so easy to make a circus or make a fool out of yourself or make yourself sound smart. I just think it's a lot easier to get your point across and get fame um, based on something you say or a decision you make or how you make a decision, like, you know, changing your hat, flipping it the other way to Ohio State instead of Michigan. I just think there's so many ways and the recruitment process itself is just such a circus. It doesn't surprise me when a kid flips his recruitment and we find out the school cheated to get a kid. I just think recruiting in general is craziness and Troy brought it up perfectly with the stuff that goes on in D2 soccer. It's crazy. So you, I can, I can imagine sitting in the chair I did at, at and I, again, not taking anything away, D2 soccer, great. Kids had a great time, but, I can only imagine what goes on in rooms in a D1 program because I've seen it. I've been around it. Coaches will be your best friend and eat dinner with you at a, at a recruiting event and then slam you in the back the next day when they're talking to a kid when they find out that you've already talked to them. And it is ridiculous. But I don't think we really planned to go like 45 minutes on that topic, Kevin, but we did. <laughs> and – uh, we just kept ranting, so I hope the, the listeners enjoyed that. I know you wanted to parlay that into some of the Big Ten recruiting stuff, so I'll let you turn it over. We'll spend a couple minutes. Nice thing about this show, we don't have time constraints, but we don't want to keep you all night. But Kevin's going to go over a couple of you know where the rankings are, some of the recruiting stuff, so I'll turn it back over to you, Kevin. Yeah, and we won't get too in-depth with this. I mean, like Troy said, we've already eaten up, and if you're still listening, you know, 45 or so minutes, 50 minutes or so into this podcast and still listening, you know, kudos to you. Obviously, we're doing our job for keeping your attention, but oh, I also wanted to bring up the recruiting rankings for the Big Ten and the class of 2017. So this upcoming fall, the freshmen will see the class of 2018, so a year from now, um, and the freshmen will see them. Obviously, all this stuff is projected, and nobody is set in stone 100% going to these programs, although the Quest 2017 is basically all set in stone for the most part. Class 2018, certainly, again, you have, you know, another basically full year until that's all set in stone. But so, again, there's a ton of time. It's still May 15th as we record this. And so there's, you know, to June, to July, to August, to September, there's another, you know, four or so months three and a half months till 2017 football season is upon us. So I'm not going to get crazy in depth here, but class of 2017 top 25 rankings for the country. Um, The big 10 has five schools in there. Ohio state's number two, Michigan's number five, Penn state's 15 that those rankings aren't really crazy. Uh, Penn state, you could say maybe deserves to be a little higher. Where's Wisconsin Um, just based on where those programs are kind of headed for the near future. But Maryland, is ranked number 18 in the class of 2017 um, and the recruiting class that they have. So again, I'm not going to get into crazy detail, but Maryland finding themselves in the top 20, Nebraska at 23 and Michigan state has had one of its worst recruiting classes ever um, for this class of 2017 coming up. That probably has to do with the fact that Michigan state won. I think it was either three or four games. I'd have to double check um, a year ago, but Michigan state, you know, kind of receiving the fallout from that now, class of 2017 rankings up and out and from what i see 
Michigan State ranked 34th. That's definitely low for Michigan State. But again, the year 2016, Michigan State had a bad football team. They didn't make a bowl game. Um, then projecting out to 2018, there are six schools in the top 25 for the Big Ten. Uh, Penn State at number two. So I think that's, you know, you're starting to see Penn State kind of get on the uptick. Uh, James Franklin, I, I think Penn State's probably the second best team in the Big Ten behind Ohio State, but I think it's 1A, 1B, realistically. And then I think Michigan-Wisconsin probably finishes top 10, top 15 teams by the end of the season once it's all said and done. But so Penn State's number two in the class of 2018 recruiting. Um, number four is Ohio State. Number nine is Nebraska. Number 13 is actually Northwestern. <laughs> so Northwestern coming in number 13 for the 2018 recruiting rankings. Again, still got another basically full year for all this to sort itself out, but Northwestern at 13, Minnesota at 14, Michigan 16, Wisconsin 25 to round out the Big Ten. Um, just think it's, it's interesting to look at these rankings, especially class of 2017, now that's basically all said and done. Um, I think you're seeing the heavyweights kind of up there. Wisconsin's not to be seen in the top 34 at least. Um, and then class of 2018, you got six Big Ten teams. So I think recruiting in general for the Big Ten, you're obviously seeing numerous top five recruiting classes being in there. Uh, class of 2018 has three. Um, they've got five in the top 15 or six in the top 16. Um, so actually it's seven schools. Sorry, Penn State, Ohio State, Nebraska. Northwestern, Minnesota, Michigan make up the top 16 for class of 2018 recruiting rankings. And then Wisconsin's coming in at 25. So there's actually seven Big Ten schools in the top 25 for the class of 2018. So a ton of numbers and schools, and I'm sure you forgot half of exactly what I just said, but you can go on to whatever recruiting website and see that the Big Ten basically is doing really well. And Wisconsin may be a little bit behind. Michigan State definitely this year having a poor recruiting class compared to years prior. Um, but you're seeing the blue bloods of the Big Ten pick things up, have top five, top ten recruiting class rankings, and that's really where championships are won. Yes, you can have a three-star kid and mold him into a five-star after three, four seasons, and they become a first-round pick. Wisconsin's notorious for that, especially on the offensive line. Wisconsin usually doesn't get you know, numerous five-star offensive linemen, yet every single year they basically have a top five offensive line in the country and a top five running back running behind it, it seems like. So Wisconsin does extremely well with the talent they get. It's not to bash Wisconsin saying they got the, the number 25 class or, oh, my God, Michigan's you know sitting there at number 16. What's Michigan doing? Uh, Michigan for the class of 2017 is number five. Class of 2018, number 16. So, oh, my God, is Michigan you know falling off the board? I don't think that's the case. I just think you're getting a decent glimpse of what's to come in the Big Ten recruiting. I think all these schools are starting to do really well. And I guess the last point I had to make with it is that I think coaches are being paid appropriately in the Big Ten as opposed to other conferences like the SEC. Wisconsin, again, comes to my mind exactly, and then I'll turn it over to you, Troy, but Wisconsin had Brett Bielema, and he was making Rose Bowls and you know winning uh, Big Ten, you know at least – co-Big Ten titles or getting to the Big Ten title game, getting to the Rose Bowl, getting, you know, big bowl games out of Wisconsin, finishing in the top ten, and then he leaves for Arkansas. <laughs> Arkansas in the middle of the SEC, you know, just not a, a top-end program whatsoever, and he leaves. And part of that was because the assistants at Wisconsin weren't paid as much as the assistants were at the time at Arkansas. So his assistants would leave or he couldn't get the best assistance at Wisconsin. So he left for an SEC school where he knew that they were given resources to pay a top assistance. My point being, I think the Big Ten is getting these top high-end coaches now, like Urban Meyer, like James Franklin, Paul Chris, getting paid accordingly. Um, Jim Harbaugh, obviously, at Michigan, top-end paid coach. Uh, Mark D'Antonio, I, I believe, is in the top 15 for coaches' pay. Um, on an annual basis now. So I think the Big Ten is catching up with every other conference, a.k.a. the SEC, and how much they pay not only the head coach, but the assistants and the facilities and all that. I think the Big Ten is doing a good job and it's paying off in these recruiting r rankings like you can see. So I think the Big Ten is here to stay. I don't think it's going anywhere. As I've said before on the show, I think Big Ten football this season, 2017, will be the best conference top to bottom. And even at the top, like I said, I think four schools can finish in the top 10. 
I think the Big Ten will be the best conference by the end of the season. And I think part of that is because the resources and money is being flowed into these teams and how much the coaches can be paid, which again results into better recruits, which obviously results into a better team nine times out of ten. Here's what I'm going to say about your recruiting rankings, Kevin. <laughs> Throw them away. I don't care. That's what I say. It's great for the media. It's great for the fans. Who cares? It's a kid that's playing high school football right now. I don't care how talented he is. Could he turn out to be a number one overall draft pick? Sure, he could. He could also come to college and, and not pan out. So it's kind of like you said, a lottery for the NFL draft, Kevin. That's what recruiting is. I mean, and I firsthand, I'm, I was a former coach. Yeah, this is what I think I'm getting, and then all of a sudden you get them into a system. They start playing. They start doing stuff. Oh, by the way, they get caught up in college life and they don't turn out to have the right character that you thought they had. Now, granted, these big-time big, big time schools, they could care less about that character issue. That is for another day, another topic, so on and so forth. But as far as the ratings go, I know people like to look at them. People like to critique them. People like to make predictions off them. And I say hogwash. I could care less. I care less if Wisconsin is the 30th-ranked recruit. Can Paul Chris coach? Did he recruit the right kids for his system? That's what I look for. That's what a coach needs to do. Is it great to get that athlete, that stud athlete? Sure, it is. But at the end of the day, a stud athlete, he might be more talented than Joe Blow who grew up under the bridge. But Joe Blow under the bridge is going to remind me of Rudy. He's going to come in. He's going to play hard every day, every minute. He may not win you a game, but if you can take that work ethic and put it into a three-star, who's to say that three-star can't turn into a number one draft pick? You mentioned it. Wisconsin does it. So I could care less about the stars. I could care less about, ooh, Penn State's number two. They're going to win the national championship. Don't mean crap to me. Does not mean crap. I mean, I like to look at it. I look at it like you do. Oh, this kid's going there and this kid's going there. And you put a lot of talent together, and yeah, you're going to be good. But at the end of the day, can you coach? And I think there's a difference between recruiting and coaching. And when people look at the overall college aspect of coaching, there is a huge difference. Can you coach? Are you a good coach? And then the second piece, are you a good recruiter? Those that can do both, they're great. Those that can do one or the other, nah, they fizzle out. They, they wind out their contract. How many times, Kevin, have you seen a big name or a great recruiting class and the coach can't win? Because he can't coach. He's a great recruiter. He can't coach. Or you see a coach that is a good coach, but he doesn't have the talent. He can't win games. Boom, he gets fired. So you got to find when you're a college coach, you have to know how to do both. You've got to be – a good coach and a good recruiter. Now, granted, the recruiting process, I could go on, Kevin. I really could. I'm not going to. I'm going to make it short. Head coach does not do all of the recruiting. Even at Division II soccer, I did minimal recruiting. My assistant did most of the work, Kevin. He found names. He inquired. He made phone calls. I went to games. I talked to parents. I did evaluate kids because it's D2. We didn't have all the resources D1 has. So do you think Paul Christ is, is filing through 200 players, Kevin, to find one? No, he's got a bunch of peons doing it for him. He's, and they're coming to him with 10 guys and say, hey, I want you to look at these guys. We like them. That's the way it works. But I had to throw that out there about the rankings. I could care less. That's all I got. No, yeah, and it's a very good point. I mean, like you said, and I brought up Wisconsin's offensive line as a perfect example. My friend and I, um, a few days ago, we were talking about basketball recruiting rankings, and we looked back on the last, it was either four or five seasons, we looked back at the top two point guards in each of those recruiting classes going into college and where they are now, how they did in college. They were literally, all of them were bad. Not necessarily in college, but the NBA, they're like now no names. It was the last like four or five recruiting classes. Um, 
you look at the top two ranked point guards in those recruiting classes and where they went, and you think, oh, my God, point guard, you know, leadership position, you have to be so successful. And obviously, you know, you're going to have your Chris Pauls and your James Hardens and your Russell Westbrooks, and obviously they're going to be the top recruited guys. Well, they weren't the last, like, four or five years. Literally, there were a few that were sprinkled in that had really nice college careers, and a couple of them are in the NBA now. So nothing to take away from them, but to be the top point guard of your entire recruiting class and then to end up as a decent backup in the NBA, I mean, that's fine and cool, but like you said, there are guys like Isaiah Thomas for the Boston Celtics picked 60th overall in the NBA, and he's five foot nine and not extremely heavily recruited, and yet he is an all-star easily, and Boston will chant MVP every time he's at the free throw line, and they legitimately believe it. <laughs> because of how much of the offense is put on his back. So take recruiting cr- rankings for what they're worth. I like looking at them, like Troy said, but to take it note by note and to say Penn State has the number two recruiting class for 2018 or Ohio State has the number two recruiting class for 2017 doesn't necessarily mean Ohio State or Penn State going to win a national title, appear in the national title. Some of those kids will flame out. Again, they're lottery tickets, like me and Troy have brought up numerous times. They're lottery tickets. You don't know exactly what you're getting. You don't know the baggage that comes with them. You don't know how hard a three-star kid is going to work day in, day out, whether it's with a coach and violating the NCAA rules or on his own just to get better and watching film and whatever the case may be. You don't know how this stuff is going to play out. It just gives you a general feel for the talent, at least by some of the quote-unquote experts as to the type of talent that's coming into these programs. You don't want to be at the bottom of these rankings, but just because you're at the top or the top 10 doesn't mean you're going to finish there. So I'm with you. You can somewhat throw it out the window. You really like this rule violation today. You're really on that kick. <laughs> you're really oh, on I this am. kick about everybody's a cheater. <laughs> you're, you're, I, like, I, everybody's a cheater today. That's my belief. D1 football, your favorite school, your alum, you know, the school you graduated from, they cheat in some way. That's my firm belief. I don't care who it is. Again, I come from Whitewater, and there were rumblings about the football team getting perks here and there with their housing. I'm not 100% sure. I don't know if that happened. I don't know if it's complete crap. I don't know if Whitewater followed the rules 100%. I don't know if Ohio State now under Urban Meyer follows the rules 100%, but I would be willing to bet against it in whatever way or form, I think your favorite team cheats in one way or another. That's just my I'll, little little take. Well, I, gotta, I, I guess I have another relevant story as a coach because I was a D, D3, transitioned to D2 for soccer, and I wanted to make sure my student-athletes graduated. Maybe one of the dying breeds of coaches. might be a reason why I'm not coaching anymore. I'm not going to let that cat out of the bag. But I wanted to implement study table, Kevin. Did you know that I could not – I could implement a study table. But I wanted to actually have tutors available. Did you know that I could not hire tutors? I had to use the university resources to make sure – that if I provided that service, that those tutors were available for anyone, just not student athletes. So I would have been cheating had I used the tutor at my study table. That's you know, terrible. You, I, I you mean, wanted to help your kids learn. That's terrible. So here's my point to this. <laughs> you say that all D1 schools are cheaters. I agree. I would say that most schools, if you actually wanted to go in and find something, every school has broken a rule. Maybe not intentionally. Maybe not intentionally. Because I actually, we we self-reported once when I gave out a free meal accidentally, just out out of the goodness of my heart. The guys worked hard. I'm like, yeah, let's have a little barbecue. No, couldn't do it. It It's illegal. We reported to the NCAA. Then nothing came of it because we self-reported it, but that was illegal. And I was just trying to be nice. Just trying to be nice. Right. You know, and so <laughs> it, if you really wanted to dissect every school into menial little things, probably every school has violated the rule. Now, 
how blatantly, and I think that's where you're going with it because you really like cheaters today, that's, <laughs> that, that's it. Yeah, you're, you're, you're getting into it. But I agree with you. And like I said, I heard I, – I had parents tell me, it's about the money. It's about the well, – what are you going to give my kid to come to school here? Uh, scholarship? Uh, room and board? And, yeah, that's it. Uh, uh, what else do you want? So we – I never had – I don't have any juicy story about somebody asking for a car or for thousands of dollars or anything like that. But I've had parents, and that's why I said, parents, keep your darn noses out of it. Let the kid decide where they want to play. But, yeah, I've, I've had parents where the best deal is where my kid's going. So no juicy stories. Sorry about that. <laughs> Understandable. You've certainly had, you know, juicy stuff and brought – great attention to certain stories that you've had as a coach and I've loved it. And I'm sure our listeners have as well. Um, we've pushed over an hour now with this recruiting stuff and Troy texted me before the show. He's like, Hey, you know, what do you want to talk about today? And I was like, Oh, there's this recruiting story that came out from Wisconsin, you know, during one of my shifts and it hit well on the internet. So we'll, we'll bring it up. And then, you know, we'll talk about it and talk a little bit about recruiting stuff and we'll see how long it takes us. Well, now it's been over an hour and we don't have many shows go over an hour deliberately and this one went over an hour. So that's just <laughs> how much we can roll about one little topic that, you know, hey, we'll, we'll just blabber about some stuff and see where it takes us over an hour now. And the last thing, last thing I promise that I have for this recruiting stuff, and you brought it up, that even you as a head coach, D2 soccer didn't do necessarily some of the heavy lifting. I'm sure you did some heavy lifting, not to take away from you, but there were people and assistants under you to do a lot of the recruiting grunt work. And that's my thing with Duke. Um, being a Duke basketball fan, Coach K, you know, being old because he is old, um, I attribute a lot of this recent success, not necessarily to him, but Jeff Capel is the associate head coach. So he's the top assistant at Duke. I think he will be Duke's next head coach whenever Coach K's time is done. He does the bulk of the recruiting for Duke. I think that's why you've seen you had a little bit of a struggle period when Duke was kind of acclimating to the one-and-done rule. They kind of struggled for a, a few years there. And I think part of that was Coach K being an older guy and not necessarily understanding the times and how recruiting is working and this rule, this new rule that John Calipari has capitalized on in terms of getting the top guys and NBA guys to the NBA. He's been successful at that, not necessarily successful at winning titles. He's only won one at Kentucky. Duke's won multiple since that rule has been implemented. But I think even you brought it up. It's not necessarily the head coach that you can look at and say, oh, my God, you know, Wisconsin's not in the top 34 for the class of 2017 recruitings. That must mean Paul Chris sucks at recruiting. Not necessarily. It could be his assistants. It could be the type of guys that they look for. Like we've talked about, Wisconsin offensive linemen, not your typical five stars. They may not even look at five star, four star offensive linemen. They only may be looking at guys with a lot of heart and playing in the same high school system that they use at Wisconsin, and they know they'll be able to teach them well to turn into a five star caliber player in a matter of two years. So that's what they can get at Wisconsin because they're that good at coaching. So take the recruiting rankings with a grain of salt. Lorenzo Romar, not to beat on him in Washington, he got canned. He's gotten numerous top flight, top five, top end recruits to go to the University of Washington for basketball. Year after year after year, they have first round top 10 lottery picks year after year for the last like three or four years. And yet, like Markel Fultz, probably going to be the number one pick in this upcoming year's NBA draft. And he with Markel Fultz, Lorenzo Romar's Washington Huskies, went like 9-24 and 24 overall. So just because you're a great recruiter doesn't mean you're a great coach. So I thought that was also a great point you brought up. Take these recruiting classes with a grain of salt. Your top high-end coach may not even necessarily be doing all this recruiting, but it's just something interesting to look at. You can take the top point guards for the last five classes and say, okay, where are they now? They're not good. <laughs> so nothing's perfect. These are all lottery tickets. It's interesting to look at, but take it with a grain of salt, like Troy said. Yeah, I, I mean, I could go on. I could add another tidbit here and there, but then we'd go for another hour. Like I said, I just sitting in that role as a coach and doing the recruiting stuff, the scholarship stuff, uh, I could sit and 
babble for another three hours about how and what and all the time and the whole process, but I'm not going to. I think we had a great show today. I do appreciate everybody listening. I know the youngster does also. So for the youngster, Kevin Cunningham, a.k.a. Kid Cunny on Twitter, I am Old Man Troy. We'll get back at you next week. Have a good day, everyone.